Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. Happy Memorial Day. and Thanks, everyone, uh, for your service. Um, what does Memorial Day mean to you? So much. So much. Correct. Now, the Olympics are happening in Tokyo, or we think. I'm, we I'm wheezing when I go to breathe. I don't know what that is, but I, it's not... I, it would make a lot of sense if I got this right at the end, like after I've been vaccinated, a month after this is all over, I just dropped dead. Like I made it through the entire thing. I went on the road. I was not taking it seriously. I, did, I barely wore a mask. Finally get vaccinated. Memorial Day. Everything opens back up. I dropped out of it when it's not even a news story. It's not even in the top five news stories. I just pass away from COVID. Tokyo is learning that the only force stronger than a pandemic is the Olympics. Olympic organizers say games must go on. Tokyo is getting hit. Mm. In Japan, the population has turned against the Olympics. One poll found a whopping 83% opposes staging the games this summer. 83%. Nevertheless, Japanese Prime Minister Yoshida Suga, Tokyo Organizing Committee President Seiko Hashimoto, and International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach insist that the show must go on. He goes... IOC, the Olympics Committee, their spokesman, Mark Adams, went as far to say, we listen, but won't be guided by public opinion. That should be the quote of, of, of everyone in power anywhere. We listen, but we won't be guided by public opinion. We're listening, but that's where it ends. It ends at listening. Um, so they have a state of emergency happening right now because of covid and hospital capacity is a problem. And they're in some other, some type of lockdown, I believe. And they're going to do the Olympics. Um, there's also militarized security measures, including surface to air missiles ratcheted to the roof of an apartment complex to fend off terrorist attacks. That's nice. They want, you know, Olympics brings in a lot of money mm. for, I, they had, they were thinking about LA for the Olympics in a few years and everybody was like, no, because they had to move the homeless people for the Academy Awards and they got upset. They go, well, can you only imagine what will happen to the homeless in LA if you have the Olympics? I say, let them compete. But no one has thought of that compromise. Um, first of all, and I'm wearing glasses now because the lights, we're, we're in the middle of getting a new studio here. And the, light, the lights are so oppressive that they hurt my eyes. And I'm getting ready for the Miami Bitcoin conference. Uh, don't even want to tell you who we have. It is so uh, monumental. And it's going to be wild. Uh, guests. We have several guests. Several of them are trying to pull out as we speak because we're handing others, <laughs> and we, we don't know. We're, it's a real behind-the-scenes, you know, musical chairs up there to see who's going to sit with us at the main stage. Uh, when? Saturday? Saturday at 4.15. Saturday, 4.15, the main stage of the convention, Tim Dillon Show podcast with guests. Um, so this is interesting. First of all, the way I have felt about when is the last time you watched the Olympics? Oh man, probably Phelps, right? Do adults still watch the Olympics? Does anyone care? Can we stop pretending that this matters in anyone's life? This is not diplomacy anymore, like this idea that it's like it's sportsmanship and it's diplomatic and it helps. International relations to have pe it, it it does it. Uh, is, is do the Palestinians have a delegation in the Israeli and that's going to matter if Israel and Palestine play volleyball? Is that really going to matter? 
I understand at a time potentially, but right now I think things are at the point now where no one cares anymore about this. Adults do not watch from what I mean, children watch it. My dad and me used to watch it. We used to watch uh, the Olympics because they people had fun names like Peekaboo Street, that skiing, mm-hmm. or or there was a speed skater named Hey Chavo. We liked that, um, and you'd watch it with you. You know, I'd sit there with my dad, and we'd eat Haagen Dazs ice cream, and and uh, and fast food, and we'd watch the Olympics, um, and then you know they would have all these inspiring stories of people, but the stories now have gotten so hellish. They've gotten so disturbing that, and first of all, have you ever met anyone that like got close to the Olympics or qualified for the Olympics and went and didn't place, like these are the most destroyed people you'll ever meet. Like my friend's sister like went to the Olympics in volleyball, like nothing happened. And she just, I mean, the woman is a wreck. She's just like a tall beanstalk of a woman. And we'll, we'll tell people like she went to the Olympics, but nothing, nothing came out of it. So it's, it's, it's only nice if you're winning a medal, truly. Otherwise, and it used to be like, oh, you know, she was the youngest of six kids and she used to ski going down the stairs. Like they were like heartwarming stories about the Olympians, like she used to put on, you know, she used to take her brother's, uh, you know, uh, skateboard and pretend that they were, it was a snowboard and she would go down the stairs and and then she became the greatest skier. Now the stories, because life has gotten harrowing, the stories are so horrible now that you're not, you, you're just worried about the people that are in the Olympics. It's like too much of a pressure cooker Bring up that article I told you about this. This article, listen to this, by the way. This is, listen to this. This is the title of the CNN article. Depression drove her close to suicide. Now, Olympian Raven Saunders wants to, quote, destigmatize mental health. Um, and, And good for her. But the idea that she was close to suicide and then she discovered the shot put is... Troubling. Since returning from the 2016 Rio Olympics, her mental health had spiraled. Sitting at the wheel of her car, her mind was now drawn to a dark place from which there seemed to be no return. As she circled past a drop-off along the Mississippi Highway, the urge to veer off the road towards the towering trees below was almost overwhelming. This is nice, huh? This will be a nice uh, montage they do. Just have her sitting in her car. They'll recreate it. They're like, can you take us through the route where you thought about driving off the highway? We want to film it. We want to have like a little compilation before you go up and and lose. It was like no one really understood the pain and the challenges I was going through. Saunders, who placed fifth in the shot put. This is what I mean. If if, If they go and it doesn't happen, it's curtains. It got worse and worse and worse and worse till it all boiled over. I remember in the morning just going through the motions, kind of being in a daze, having things to do, but not really having any motivation or any care to really get anything done. Then hopping in my car and driving and looking at that spot. A few months before, Saunders had considered how the chances of survival would be slim if someone was to drive off the edge of the same drop-off she now circled past. However, it was an impromptu text to a former therapist, really a last-ditch effort that saved her life. She soon received a response, was it better help? Providing her with the reassurance and courage to go home and get the help she needed. Today, she's preparing for the Olympic trials in June with the prospect of her second Olympics looming. She wants to, quote, destigmatize mental health And help others who, like her, can get caught up in cycles of depression and anxiety. So these are the types of stories you're going to hear at the Tokyo Olympics. I mean, if you think, I mean, there's not going to be any more cute, like, uh, you know, stories where it was like, 
you know, this athlete, you know, we always knew they were special. It's going to be like, I wanted to hang myself. <laughs> and then I decided that my only hope was fucking synchronized swimming. I had an eating disorder for many years where I would vomit up everything that I ate. But then I realized that that positioned me perfectly to be a synchronized swimmer. And, and I like it because only my legs show and the rest of my body's in the water because I still can't look at myself without wanting to purge. But I can look at my feet and those are the only things that come out of the water. I keep them perfectly pointed. I mean, get ready for the tragedy like you have never, I mean, it's going to be, and it used to be like they were athletes and it was like, you know, great athletes that had like worked their entire lives at, at being athletes. Now it's just going to be people who you, you're worried about and you don't think they should, you actually go, we don't think you should go. We don't think you should do this. Like after I read that, I go, I don't know if you should do this. <laughs> This might, what happens if you lose again? What happens if she comes in and this time she comes in seventh? It's back to the car. Isn't it? That's a problem. She's going to be driving on that same fucking stretch of highway. It's going to be sad. And now with COVID, I mean, there's going to be like some memorial in Japan to COVID, which people are still dying of COVID, by the way. Yeah, Osaka's getting yeah, ravaged. Yeah, they're getting yeah. ravaged. So what they're going to do is, like, you know, like, it, it, they're just going to, like, they're just going to release, like, you know, those lanterns into the air, and one represents everybody who is still in a hospital bed. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be very strange Olympics, I think. We don't need it. We can skip it. Who believes, no one believes that they're going to be in the Olympics, by the way. Like, no one gets, like, very few people get into the Olympics. Nobody, like, my mother was a swim coach, and I think a few of those people got to the Olympic trials. It's very, very tough to get into the actual Olympics. It doesn't motivate anybody. It might, you know, but I just don't think it it matters anymore. It doesn't really matter anymore. And I don't I don't remember the last time anyone I know has said, did you see the Olympics? I don't care. I don't root for America. I don't care who wins. I don't really care. I mean, that's the other thing. Does anyone give a shit if your country beats another country? No one really cares anymore. We've gotten soft here. We're probably going to lose. And aren't these people all junked up anyway? Aren't these a bunch of drug addicts? I mean, they have to they have to test them like nine times to make sure they're not like skin popping steroids in the locker room right before they get in the pool. Aren't these old junkies anyway? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've just created a race of junkies to perform. These people, some of them have natural talent, but but everybody's doping. That's what the Olympics is. It's a bunch of it's it's like a bunch of lab rats doping and I don't I don't get inspired by it is my point I'm uninspired by the Olympics I don't need it and I don't know why you need it but it's it's a it's an antiquated idea I understand that people think it's important but it's not just leave it alone that's my take on it I don't need to see a bunch of drug addicts run around and do hurdles. I can skip that. And I think you should too. And I don't need all the stories about she was raised by a single mother in the bayou, you know? And now she does hurdles. Good. <laughs> Good. Moving on. Like, I just don't, I don't need that. It's going to be, and here's the other thing about destigmatizing mental health. You know, I'm let me say this at the risk of offending anyone. Can we destigmatize people who aren't mentally ill? Because I believe they are getting a lot of pushback right now in society. The people who are not insane, I feel like are having a much tougher time of it. 
mentally ill people and not real mental illness like my mother has, like schizophrenia. But I mean, uh, mentally ill seems to kind of be a little bit of a benefit in certain industries, certainly the one I'm in. Can we perhaps destigmatize people who don't want to kill themselves? Is that okay? Is it okay that someone doesn't want to kill themselves anymore? <laughs> well, can we destigmatize that experience in life? People who don't want to take their car and drive it off a road? Do you think they have anything interesting to add? Everything now is about destigmatizing mental health, which I don't even know what that means. How about funding it? Fun, give, give it funding and help people that are insane. I don't know what destigmatizing mental health means. And they're rarely talking about like schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder. It's always anxiety and depression. Yes. It's never any of the serious, real bipolar. It's always anxiety and depression, which can be real and can be serious. But also there's a lot of people that are diagnosing themselves off of Instagram. And they really have no idea what they have. Uh, they're fetishizing mental illness. It's becoming their identity. And uh, they're leaning into it. And this is, I am a person that understands this because I have a mother who's seriously mentally ill, like real mentally ill, like not like she doesn't have a Twitter. They're not doing a profile, her in, uh, in Rolling Stone, Chris Gethard, like she's actually mentally ill. It's not like a way to just put a bunch of young kids in a room and make money on them. Just as she's got an actual problem. So I, that's my concern only. My concern is that, but no, it'll be fun. Get me some, uh, get me some uh, inspirational Olympic style music. Okay. I want to. I want to read this again with some inspirational Olympic. I just love on YouTube. Tim Dillon discusses birds. <laughs> oh, from that. That was a good episode. I, I don't even remember Monkey that. Monkey sex traffickers when the bird was screaming outside. Yes. Um, Olympic sport, music free, no copyright. Let's try yeah. this one. There was not a day that went by that she didn't feel like taking her car and driving it off the road. She imagined the sweet release of being plunged into sub-zero freezing water. She had read she would only survive for 60 seconds, and that was okay with her. As she could feel the water literally choking her, her body, all of her extremities, losing feeling as she slipped into the darkness which she called home. The final comfort, her final resting place. As she thought about taking that sweet barrel of a gun and putting it right in her mouth, blowing her brains out of the back of her head, not one day went by when she didn't think of lighting her house on fire and locking herself in. The sweet smell of her burned flesh signifying that her earthly race had been run. But then, she discovered pole vaulting, and that changed her life. His mother and father raped him constantly. They would, they would, they would sell him to other pedophiles in the community. When he was a young boy, he learned a deep sense of shame after killing both of his parents and then being and then being sentenced to a juvenile hall for only three years because of the heinous nature of their crimes against him, he finally started running. Ironically, something he should have done years before. He ran and ran. He jumped over hurdle. He finally found his sister, his long lost sister later in life, and she raped him. And that gave him the strength to pursue his dreams of running and jumping over hurdles. And now he is here to compete in the Tokyo COVID Games. This is a very inspiring story. This young girl, for many, many years, was a Nazi. <laughs> Raised in a small, quiet suburban town in Georgia, she discovered the alt-right at a young age. She started live streaming, started asking questions about Jewish people, 
and the shapes of other people's skulls. For many years, she became a shit poster. She fought against misogyny in the alt-right online community for many years, establishing herself as one of the preeminent shit poster trolls in the neo-Nazi gaming community. Then, she left all that behind to swim at the Tokyo Games. No longer a Nazi, though not really comfortable with everyone different races. We did observe that, she was a little weird. But she's here now, leaving all that behind to be an Olympian, what she was destined to be. We are investigating an incident where there was a swastika in the pool locker room. We're not accusing her, but we're not, we're not exactly exempting her either. But that's what you're going to get at the Olympics this year. It's just going to be a horror beyond human comprehension. And you're just going to have to sit there and go, oh, good. Who's competing now? It's the ex-Nazi versus the person whose parents repeatedly raped them. Uh, tough call. We don't know. Have you ever browsed in incognito mode? Well, think about this. Incognito mode, like the Chrome browser, is a Google product, and Google has made its fortune by tracking your movements online. There's even a $5 billion class action lawsuit against a company in California where it's accused of secretly collecting user data. Google's defense, incognito mode does not mean invisible. So do you actually make yourself as invisible as possible online? If you really want to, you got to go to ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is a virtual private network that allows you to browse the web without companies tracking you and selling your data. ExpressVPN is essential if you want to uh, see all kinds of different content from other parts of the world. You can set your location in the UK. How do you watch UK Netflix? So if you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. That's expressvpn.com slash Tim Dillon. We have it. Ben uses it. We love it. Uh, whenever we're talking to a journalist like Abby Martin or Whitney Webb, this is what we use, that and Signal. And uh, we really love it. Expressvpn.com slash Tim Dillon. And you get a deal. You get an extra three months for free. Is that not crazy? 90 days free, expressvpn.com slash Tim Dillon. Thank you for supporting the show. Magic Spoon, baby, zero grams of sugar, 13, 14 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories a serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, GMO-free. Build your own box. Available flavors you can build are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon. Magic Spoon is great. I eat it. It's tasty. Ben eats it. Everyone we know eats it. Go to magicspoon.com slash Tim Dillon to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try today. If you have kids, get them started on Magic Spoon. Don't let them eat that sugary shit from the grocery store. They're going to grow up to be drug addicts and murder you. But if you allow them to eat Magic Spoon, they feel like it's fruity because it is and it's good and it's tasty, but there's no real sugar in it. They use high quality sweeteners like monk fruit. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product is back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. But nobody wants a refund. They all want more cereal. So remember, cereal, <laughs> cereal. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash Tim Dillon and use the code Tim Dillon to save $5 off your cereal. Thank you, Magic Spoon. But God love everybody. Friends did a reunion, which was uh, completely unnecessary. But Friends was the biggest show mm. when we were growing, when I was growing up. I forget you're younger than me. Mm. Look at that hoodie, everybody. Are you nuts? Not getting that? Fakebiz.net. Can you move the... There it is. Sit down. When I was growing up, I was into Frasier because it was a smarter show and it was better written. But then you had your Seinfeld people. Uh, you had your Frasier people. You had Friends people. I would occasionally watch Friends, but I never cared about it. Friends is a very interesting time capsule of New York City because... You know, they lived in these big apartments. It wasn't even realistic during the time, but it was more realistic than it would be now. Where like you have this, well, maybe not now, rent has dropped. But, you know, you had these massive apartments where people lived there and it was like somebody was an actor, or somebody worked at a coffee house. It was like, how's this happening? And they never met a black person. Well, they they had, there were a few black guest stars, but it was, it was that's the, they get uh, flack for the lack of diversity. Um, 
But then they had a reunion, which I didn't watch, but um, people were saying that the reunion disappointed them because, I mean, this, this is where people are. People are so miserable right now that if there's any, like, outpouring of joy, people go, wait a minute, why isn't this being tempered with a little bit of misery? Why aren't people being made, being made to feel uncomfortable? Why is everyone happy? That's really what a lot of this comes down to is people are just completely disgusted with the idea that other people might be happy for a period of time without introducing uh, something horrific. And people were upset that uh, the cast of Friends was not castigated more for their problematic moments, which, by the way, none of them are really problematic. Like, when you look at the things that they're upset with friends with, with the show. For example, in this article, which is, should we forgive friends for feeling a little offensive? Um, if you go down here, they said that, they said that Chandler was homophobic because they would have these gay panics where uh, basically, you know, uh, Chandler and Joe, like they would be like, um, you know, do I look gay or do I seem gay or whatever? Mm. Which is, by the way, that's not homophobic for straight guys to think, right? I mean, I I, I don't think that's inherently homophobic mm. for a straight guy to go, do I seem gay right now? Because if the goal is to hook up with women, then maybe seeming gay isn't a, the greatest idea. I mean, now no one seems gay or straight. People are genderless drones, but... I mean, I don't think it's inherently homophobic for somebody to go, do I look gay? And maybe they want to look gay. I mean, maybe you know, gay can be a compliment in many, in many uh, ways, the, the way people look, not not the way I dress, but gay people are usually very in shape and fashionable. But I, the idea that he, that he goes, hey, maybe I look gay, that it's homophobic. Also, Friends was insanely progressive. Like, you know, Ross the, with the two lesbians, I forget, it was his ex-wife or whatever. Chandler's dad was a uh, drag queen. Mm -hmm. And one of the jokes they're upset about is when Chandler, um, Chandler says his dad opens a door and like full drag and Chandler, Chandler goes, hi dad. Mm -hmm. And the joke is like, great. This is my dad. So here they go. Today it is a bit jarring to see Chandler greet Turner, his father mm -hmm. in full makeup and a dress with a sardonic. Hi dad. Followed by a laugh track. Why? I don't understand. If your dad is in full drag, it is at the very least in most cases not what you expected. Can we say that? And when he answers the door, he goes, hi, dad. Like, great. Like, this is dad. Right. He's in full drag. Yeah. I mean, the joke there is that, listen, no one is supposed to be like, People are always going to have to find reasons that they're a little embarrassed of their parents. This is the reality of, of growing up. Your parents get older. Uh, you realize that they're fallible human beings. There's always a reason you're a little offended by your parents. It doesn't mean it's the right reason or the, a good reason, right? I talk about my mother investing in Beanie Babies. Um, I think the joke is like, hi, dad. Like, great, this is dad. You know, I don't think it's I hate my dad. I think he loved his dad. And he and it even says in the article, but Chandler's acceptance of his dad becomes a growth experience. And the show deals more with the breakup of his parents' marriage than his father's sexuality. Um, OK, here's something that people at Glad did. Well, they go Ray Bradford, director of entertainment media for Glad, said that even today the portrayal wasn't what we hate seeing on TV by a mile. So, again, they're looking for reasons to be upset, mm. but even Glad, which is crazy, said that this is okay. Really, it's not offensive um, at all. And then there were, I didn't, I didn't care that much about Friends, um, but it was this cult show. And I, I, when I was a tour guide in New York City, I realized how many people around the world loved it. Like people from the UK were obsessed with it. Mm. Um, problematic. Plot lines into the one with all the fat shaming. Mm. Well, you know what's interesting? I watched the pilot of Beverly Hills 90210. Mm. I was just curious as to what was going on. Mm. Uh, I watched the pilot of Beverly Hills 90210. The pilot, Jenny Garth, uh, you know, Brenda, played by Shannon Darty, hot chick, Jenny Garth, <clears throat> hot chick. 
Brenda moves to Be- Be- Beverly Hills from Minnesota with Jason Priestley, her brother. And it's her first day in the new school. And of course, it's Beverly West Beverly High and everybody's rich and da-da-da. And there's a scene in the pilot where... Um, and I don't know if you could play this, right? No, I, I, we can't play something like you that. You can't play yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a fat girl walks into um, bio or biology or chemistry, where, where, you know, where you have a lab partner mm-hmm. and you both sit at a table in high school. And the looks that the fat girl got in the, in the room, everybody was like, Ugh. like, I mean, visually repulsed at the idea of, so when the fat girl walks by them, they all move their books so that she can't sit there because she thinks somebody else is there. And Jenny Garth, the blonde, they get to her and the fat girl goes, hey, is there anyone sitting here? And Jenny Garth goes, yeah. Yeah, there are. And she goes, who? Because the fat girl's had it now. She goes, who's sitting here? And Jenny Garth, as soon as Shannon Darty walks in, Jenny Garth goes, that girl. And then Shannon Darty comes and sits down. And then they have a scene only a few minutes later where uh, Brenda goes, yeah, Minnesota's really fun because you can eat all winter and hide it under a sweater. And Jenny Garth goes, yeah, here everybody's always having a pool party, so you can't really pig out that much. So I don't know that that was healthy, by the way. I don't know that th- that extreme was needed because it was it was essentially the promotion of bulimia mm-hmm. on that show. Mm-hmm. But we've now gone so the other way where... It's it's also completely ridiculous, as I've covered in previous episodes with the fat activist movement. Now, what is... I don't really remember this storyline on Friends. Is this the one where Phoebe's in a fat suit? I believe so, yeah. Or Monica's in a fat suit. The fat suit that Courtney Cox is wearing is incredible. Monica is also portrayed yeah. as being insanely possessive of her food, as though an overweight person must eat constantly, and that's funny. Spoiler alert, it is possible to be overweight and actually eat well and exercise regularly. Well, that is true, but that's it's a true, yeah. small percentage of people. We also see Fat Mon. I mean, Fat Monica is kind of funny. Yeah, it was funny. So the problem funny. is that Fat Monica is portrayed as eating. So there's this idea that we need to divorce fat from eating, which I don't know is scientifically true. The idea that we need to get rid of the link mm. between fat and eating food they seem somewhat inextricably linked it's very odd to me that we have that uh situation here but the friends reunion um if you loved friends go check it out who got fat uh chandler chandler yeah chandler Mm -hmm. got he got big Mm -hmm. good for him he got big, huh? And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm a fat activist. Mm-hmm. But let's take a look at him. Oh, he doesn't look that big. I think people were saying his speech is a little slurred. I don't know. If, I, I didn't watch it, so. But he doesn't look bad. Was it Matt LeBlanc? Was it Joey? Jennifer Aniston looks exactly how she looks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Everybody else looks a little haggard. But that Jennifer Aniston looks great. Well, good for them. Maybe they can compete in the Olympics. Every uh every everybody now is obviously Bitcoin has crashed. We have the convention coming up. It has lost half of its value. Um, roughly half of its value. Where is it right now? About 35,000? Mm-hmm. Great. And we all know that we've been on this, uh, we've been riding this economic um, you know, train here at high speed for well over a decade. I mean, this is one of the biggest bull markets in history for the longest amounts of time. Mm-hmm. A lot of people said that it speculated it should have ended pre-COVID, but COVID uh, just allowed the government to print money and artificially subsidize everybody's lives. Uh, their new homes, their, you know, uh, cheap interest rates, you know, put money into the economy, stimulus, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually this is all coming to an end. Every financial show now literally introduces every guest like this. You're like, uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest says that the entire world, the entire world economy will be destroyed within 72 hours. Give it up for Peter Schiff. And then Peter Schiff comes out and he's like, you know, literally, and I like Peter Schiff, but he's this libertarian who lives in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. who gets hard every time the economy's about to tank. Mm -hmm. Every time there's about to be like a serious dip, Peter Schiff's on every show talking about stagflation. He loves it. He just start. he gets, we want him on here. Let's get him. Somebody email Peter Schiff. Um, it, we want him on here. Uh, he does not like Bitcoin. He's a big gold guy. He goes, fuck Bitcoin. It'll never be gold. I wanted to bring him to the Bitcoin convention and have him just screaming at the people and have them booing him, being like, fuck you. And he's like, it'll never be gold. And they're like, boo. But that's every financial story right now is that it's going to end and nobody really knows when it's going to end. That's what keeps people up at night. They go, when is this going to, and how bad is it going to be when it falls apart? I mean, if you get some of these um, articles up, I mean, literally the YouTube thumbnails are like, I think Peter Schiff has one where it goes, people will lose everything. Um, I'll just type that in. You know, you know, Dent, uh, I forget his first name. Yeah, the crash is going to come sooner than you think. A new crisis is coming. I mean, this save is yourself. a planned economic collapse. Please save yourself. It's going to crash sooner than you think. I mean, he's going to start selling merch soon that just says crash. The final financial crisis. Yeah, the final financial crisis. I mean, it's just please save yourself. Prepare the worst crisis of your lifetime. I mean, it, he's, he's, his brand is like, because the thing about these guys, and listen, he's going to be right eventually. Like one day it is going to happen, yeah, yeah, yeah. but until it happens, you got to keep saying it's going to happen. Like there was a great quote where it's like Peter Schiff has predicted nine out of the last two recessions. Like he just doesn't stop. But that's the libertarian, like Austrian economist, gold standard guys. And I get it, but they're always like, it's, coming and it's gonna be bad and when it comes whoo stock market's gonna go to zero like <laughs> they go some of these guys some of these they it just they they're literally it's just like stock market's gonna go to zero so if you want to learn how to save yourself sign up for the thing that i am selling now you might think to yourself hey if the stock market goes to zero and we go back to a barter economy nothing in your newsletter is really going to help me. You might have that thought. You might have the thought that like, I don't know, last summer people couldn't work for a while. Uh, the cops did some fucked up shit. And there was a month of riots when we still had food and some of us still had money. So you'd imagine at stock market zero with nothing going on, your newsletter isn't really going to make it all okay. You'd imagine it would get pretty bad pretty quickly, you know? Uh, it would be like I am legend overnight. But if you want to know what to happens in that situation, if you want to know how to protect yourself and your assets, sign up for my newsletter. Where are you typing your newsletter from when they stormed the house? And, and he lives in Puerto Rico. A lot of these guys, the Paul brothers, a lot of them are getting sick of taxes. And they go to Puerto Rico and they get 4% tax. Should we call the New York Times reporter and tell him that I changed my mind and I want to yeah, talk? Give him my number. Mine's hooked up. I'll call Because we shouldn't call him from yours, right? Why not? Let's see if, let's see if, let's see if we could call him because... Um, a New York Times reporter reached out. They're like, "Do you have?" It? They're clearly reading some hit, writing some hit piece on Rogan, and they're like, "Do you have any comment?" And I was like, "Hey, respectfully, fuck off." This is his. Uh, this is his email. Hey, Tim. This is Matt. Blah blah from the New York Times. By the way, the uh, the 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 header to the email, like the subject line, was like, "Hey, New York Times." It was like, "Hey, NYT." It's like, "What?" Hope you're doing well. I hope you don't mind. Blank pass along your email. I first met him years ago for a story about Stephen Miller, the Trump guy who happened to be his classmate. I'm working on a Rogan profile, which of course we know means hit piece, mm. and have been making the rounds with Assorted Friends Comics podcast. It'll be very interesting to see who talked. I was hoping you might be up for a chat too, mostly trying to get a feel for Joe as a host and what it's like to be on the show, etc. I'm at blank. 
Uh, if you got a few this week or next, appreciate any help. Should I call him and tell him that I I I want to report that Rogan raped me? <coughs> Take call his number now. Can we call his number? Mm -hmm. We're gonna call him and we're gonna say, "Listen, I apologize for I I outed it on social media because I want people to know he is working on a hit piece, mm -hmm. and I want dummies." See, some of these reporters are good. They make it sound like it's an approved piece, mm -hmm. but what it really is is a hit piece. So they call people that know you, and they go, hey, so we're working on this big thing and right. with, with whoever, with Tim, with Joe. And then they then people get lulled into. All right, I'm going to call him. He knows Ben Avery's name. All right, hang up. Maybe he'll call back. Does anyone answer on the sixth ring? No. Should I shoot him a text? Um, no. Let him call back. Okay. If he calls back, okay. which he might not. But, of course, I said, hey, fuck off, mm -hmm. because... You know, I know how people twist words and everything. He's like, I wanted to get a feel for Joe as a host. I'm like, watch the show. Mm -hmm. Hey, right, right. Matt, right. do some work. But what they want to do is they want to convince people that this is like an approved thing and that, uh, you know, it's, oh, it's positive. It's positive. And we are just, you know, we just want to share the love that we all have for Joe at the New York Times. We just love him. And we want to share the love we have for him. So if you could participate. And there's a lot of people who will be duped into giving quotes. Mm -hmm. But I know how to deal with the press. I said, Matt, respectfully, fuck off. Because I know. I only will deal with the UK press, by the way. Because I'm trying to sell tickets over there and build more of a, a career there. And I, and I know they're trashy monsters. And I expect that. And that's okay. And I don't care. If it's me, I don't give a shit. But I'm never going to give a quote about somebody else that's going to be taken out of context or used in a piece that seeks to hurt that person, especially if it's somebody I like. But even if it's somebody I hate, I would not have participated in that if they called me and said, hey, do you know this? Uh, hey, we're doing a piece on, and I don't hate these people, but like, we're doing a piece on Chelsea Peretti. Or we're doing a piece on whoever. I would go, hey, respectfully, fuck off. That would be my answer no matter what. New York Times, we're doing a piece on this. Fuck off. Every, all answers are fuck off to the press unless it's a, the uk press and it's a and it's about me or you know whatever right. upcoming shows right. that i have or something like that i don't have time the world economy has about a week left as peter schiff says get out now i love just the youtube thumbnails are perfect I know. get out now <laughs> Most people will lose everything. That was another one. It goes, most people you know will lose everything. And by the way, I'm not even saying that he's wrong. There needs to be a correction, 100%. It's just a very fun brand to have. And I get it. Like, he's the town crier. It's like, you know, he's like the Paul Revere going through, like, the British are coming. The British, you know, get out now. Everyone you know will be dead. We're going to go back to a barter economy where we just trade gold <laughs> bars back and forth. Yeah, that'll work. And if you want to know what happens when the stock market goes to zero and uh, the supply chains all fall and no one has food, energy, money, it, when that happens, sign up for my newsletter. If you want an idea. I mean... I mean, what is the newsletter? What's the first week of that newsletter? There's just utter chaos in the street in the first week is. So I hate to say it, but I told you so. Kathy Wood blames Elon Musk. ESG investors for recent crypto crash. Speaking at Coindesk conference. Kathy, we've tried to get her on the show. Tried right. to get her as a guest at the Bitcoin conference. But she's like part of this interesting group of Christian investors. Oh, she's Christian? Yeah. Really? She's like, she's like a... Uh, like part of this weird like 
culty group of like Christian investor group. Mm. Like, you know how like in the military they have the Knights of Malta, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is like this, you know, kind of weird, like, you know, Christian group, but like fundamentalist. Uh, she's part of like some Christian investor group, you know? So I think she might find our show vulgar or crass. That's what she might, I don't know. Mm. Could be. But uh, speaking Thursday, CoinDesk Consensus 2021 Conference, Wood said, a lot of institutional buying went on pause and that it was precipitated by the ESG movement and this notion, which was exacerbated by Elon Musk, that there are some real environmental problems with the mining of Bitcoin. Mm. Recent reports have found the energy usage behind crypto mining is comparable to that of some medium-sized countries, much of it coal-powered. Crypto bulls have challenged those findings. She was talking the other day about, you know, alternative energy sources being used to mine Bitcoin. What does ESG stand for? Environmental ESG. movement. What it's, is it's like long-term people where they're like people, communities. And people, communities, and the environment, otherwise known as environmental, social, go and governance. ESG. It's a growing investment methodology for companies who want to be seen as focused on the long-term. Mm -hmm. Forward-thinking leaders in their industry, corporately responsible, better man. You know what's funny about all this stuff is that you know Lockheed Martin is now doing like woke anti-racism training. Mm -hmm. The defense contractor mm -hmm. Lockheed Martin is now like putting a bunch of white guys in a room and having them talk about their privilege. It's great. It's phenomenal. It's great. So it's we're we're beyond self-parody anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't even make fun of it. You can't do. Life is the sketch. Nothing to be made fun of here. Coming up on the show is Abby Martin, our uh uh what are she's a real journalist, she's a staunch defender of Israel. Her new documentary, Missiles, They're Fun for Everyone, uh, is out. That is, of course, a joke. Uh Abby uh has a documentary called Gaza Fights for Freedom. Um, Abby Martin is an investigative journalist who spends a lot of her time overseas uh on site reporting um from Gaza, from places like Venezuela. She joins us on the show today to break down what she sees as uh, the problem over there in uh, the Middle East. I'm getting a little sick of it, by the way. But Abby's going to break it down for us. But I'm, I'm all about quarantine's over. It's time to have fun. It's time to have fun. That's what it's time to do. But I'm very interested to hear what she has to say. Um, and then, of course, we, we would have loved to put her and Barry Weiss in tanks, like like glass boxes, and have them uh, debate each other. Interesting. And we are still booked on Barry's show. Mm -hmm. When is that? June 9th. I'll be in Florida. But... Oh, yeah. You, well, you'll just do it over the phone. It was supposed to be through Zoom. Oh, anyway. great. Yeah, yeah. Easy. Over the phone. Mm -hmm. Hi, Barry. Why not? So, without further ado, everybody, the one, the only, Abby Martin. Better help. There's a lot of people. You're coming out of the quarantine. You're going to see a lot of people. You're going to be anxious and depressed. You know there's people out there you don't want to see, but you have to. You got to deal with your own mental health. We're back, baby. Go to betterhelp.com, H-E-L-P. They've got online professional counselors, and it's all done securely. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. They got a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. Many of my friends have used BetterHelp, and they love it. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log in your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule a weekly video or phone sessions. Better HELP is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website. Read their testimonials. BetterHelp. You go to betterhelp.com slash Tim D. That's betterhelp.com slash Tim D. That's BetterHelp. And join over the 1 million people who have taken charge over their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. They're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And Tim Dillon Show listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Tim D. What a deal 10% off their first month betterhelp.com slash Tim D Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost 
I'll tell you right now, it's fun. You need a hard dick. It's going to be a great summer of fucking. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com. Consult with one of their licensed medical providers. Once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office. No awkward conversations. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. With Bluetooth, men everywhere are excited to see the postman because when your package has arrived, your package has arrived. They always say that first impressions are important. What about lasting impressions? It's time to get off the couch and go back to work. If your tool needs an upgrade, head to Bluetooth.com. Guys, there's nothing sexier than confidence. Bluetooth can help you give you the confidence when it counts. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Bluetooth free when you use our promo code TD at checkout. That's pay $5 shipping. That's Bluetooth.com promo code TD to receive your first month free. Visit Bluetooth.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Bluetooth for sponsoring the podcast. This podcast is brought to you by another podcast show. I'm not being ambiguous when I say that. That's the name of the podcast. I'm recommending another podcast show. You already know Dylan Wren, Patrick Hickey, the producer of The King of the Sting in this past week, and Nick Davis. When I raved about their hit show, another Below Deck podcast. Well, they're back like roaches who refuse to die. <laughs> they're back to ride the coattails of my success for the duration of two more ad reads after a Dogecoin-esque investment to the Tim Dillon in late 2019. This time of the more general show, unconstrained by the shackles of reality TV recaps, covering trending topics of our time, like Native American shoe salesmen, Illuminati recruiters living in rural Jamaica, and the news brought to you by Blue Chew. Call to action. Oh, so yeah, bit shoot. Bit shoot. And the news brought to you by Bit Shoot. So if you'd like to continue to support fake business, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for another podcast show. Say that Tim Dillon sent you and leave a YouTube comment on their latest episode saying that Tim Dillon sent you. One thing I will say about these guys is they keep doing it. They will not stop. You have to respect that. They've gone through like 90 versions of this show and the 91st one's going to hit. So go support them. Leave a comment. Leave a review. I mean, God only knows what they'd be doing if they weren't podcasting. It would probably be something horrible. So the fact that they have this thing that they do once or twice a week that just keeps them going is important to them. I mean, these people would be shooting you in the street when you were out with your children if they didn't have this type of thing to do. So God love them. God bless them. Go to another podcast show. Go to uh, their YouTube. Leave a comment. Leave a review. Give it a shot. Give it a listen. See what the deal is. And if not, they'll be back with something else. <laughs> because I do respect this. Another podcast show. Go leave a comment. Leave a review. Thank you. No Abby problem. looked phenomenal. <laughs> Abby looks so good. I look like shit. <laughs> how fucking, how embarrassing is this? I mean, she's, are we recording? She spends all her time in like war-torn countries. She looks great. <laughs> I'm in the suburbs with no, no problems, and I look like I've been in a war-torn country. Most people listening to this show know Abby Martin. If you don't, you should. When I say there's seven or eight journalists left in America, this is one of them. She has a documentary out called Gaza Fights for Freedom. Where can they watch that, and where can they support what you do? That's first off. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tim, sorry. Thanks, Tom. That's okay. Uh, GossipFightsForFreedom.com you can check out because it's being throttled on YouTube. Uh, YouTube is now making it impossible to actually find it if you search for it. So you have to go to our page on Empire Files uh, and actually watch it there. So you can't share it from the page. You can't search for it. Uh, they're making it pretty hard to find. Now, this I know a little bit about the... The conflict in the Middle East, you know a lot more about it. Uh, it seems clearly like an unsustainable situation. Um, what don't people get? Because I think people that are in America that are, are not really following, they only started to pay attention recently. They, It's just basically like, hey, it's two groups of people that don't like each other. That's kind of the simplistic explanation that we all, like we're all just like, hey, they don't like each other. But it's actually uh, much deeper than that, clearly, but, but this idea that I never knew that there were 2 million people kind of living in this prison that they could not leave. And could you just yeah, exactly. go into that? Yeah. Yeah. So the media tells us that it's basically two sides of the same fight, you know, two different states just warring over religion and this ancient conflict that will never be solved. And it's way too complicated for you to actually know what's going on. It's actually really 
kind of easy to understand. Uh, it's settler colonialism. We're talking about a state that was founded on top of another people. And every single day, they continue to take more of these people's land and ethnically cleanse them off the land. So there's two situations here. There's a brutal military occupation in the West Bank uh, that every day, you know, just making Palestinians lives just horrible and humiliating with checkpoints and blockades. And this is like akin to the height of the US military occupation in Iraq. I mean, this is not like an abstract thing like, oh, there's a base and soldiers milling around. No, this is like soldiers are fucking with you every single day, every second of the day, making your life insanely hard to live. You can't protest. You can't hand out political literature. You can't raise a Palestinian flag. You can't do shit. And these extremist settlers who are taking over and colonizing the land are harassing you and they are state sanctioned and they are protected by the Israeli government and they can have guns. And they're financed by the U.S. government, right? Aren't we kind of financing everything that's going on there? You know that video of the guy being like, if I don't take your house, someone else will. That, right. that dude is actually being funded to squat in a Palestinian home. He is being directly financed by NGOs in the United States and the Israeli government to do this. Um, but then you have Gaza. Gaza is basically a surplus house for refugees that were ethnically cleansed during the foundation of Israel. And they also continue to be sent there as like criminals, quote unquote criminals. The Israeli government will just like designate someone for their punishment. You are now going to live in Gaza for the rest of your days. And these people cannot leave without permits or authorization by the Israeli military. And the Egyptian military is just as hostile and they collaborate with the Israeli military. There's no basic human mobility. You can't get medical attention if you need it. Um, um, you, there's no clean water, like 97% of all the water is just non, you know, it's like unpotable water. It's dirty. And this is like the main source of disease in Gaza is, yeah. is water. That's clean electricity two to three hours a day. It is, it is hell. I also watched your health. documentary and they said there's, there's, you can't get medical supplies in. Like, you yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and right now, after what's happened, they're not letting fuel, so you can't fuel the generators. They're not allowing construction materials to rebuild. It's basically just continuous torture and punishment for what Hamas, 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 Hamas does. For 2 million people who live there, 50% of which are children. So just keep that in mind. Every time, you know, every couple of years, Israel just bombs the shit out of Gaza. That's a war on kids who right. are just innocent in the situation. What is the justification for the continually bulldozing the settlements and taking the land. Like, I think that seems to be a, a, a major problem where you're, it's, it's an expanding, it's, it's not only a, you know, like you said, a, a, you know, a colonial state, but it's expanding. It's like constantly expanding. What do you think the ultimate goal is? Is it just to get rid of all of the Palestinians? Yeah, it's to, it's to, completely kick out all the Palestinians from the land and take all of the land. And this is why you have Israeli officials and the government openly saying, no, there will be no Palestinian state. We are planning to annex the entire territory. So you have this facade propped up by U.S. politicians being like, yeah, like we believe in the two state solution. Well, Israeli government officials have not entertained the quote unquote two state solution for decades. This is this is a joke right. when it comes to Israel. Society. This is an open conquest of ethnic cleansing. And the justification is that, you know, Jews from all over the world can immediately, you know, if you have the heritage of, of Judaism in your ancestry, you have the ordained right based on biblical ancient text that you can go to this land and colonize it and take it over and you can get citizenship, which yeah. means that you are uprooting people who actually have real right. roots in the right. land who, who lived there for generations. And this is, this is what's going on every day. Netanyahu seems to have taken the thing in a, in a radical direction. I mean, not that there weren't obviously problems before. What about him specifically has presented this, uh, you know, probably uh, more radical face to what was going on? Was it just, was it, was it his party, which is the Likud party? I don't know if I'm right or not. Um, were they just like, basically like, okay, Hey, now we're going to like turn it up like now, like what w was there anybody? I mean, for lack of a better word, is, is there any moderate voices in Israel that are like, we need to not do this? 
Yeah, so there, there's not a real, like, quote-unquote, like, left opposition or, like, a center opposition that's right. strong to really be a counterweight to Netanyahu. It, it is really, like, the right wing and then, like, the fascist right wing. And Netanyahu absolutely is, uh, you know, on the fascist uptick. I mean, you can look at, like, you know, he's been fucking president forever. It's really crazy how long he's been president. <laughs> and I think that when he rose to power, he kind of emboldened a lot of society um, to basically come out of the shadows and just embrace kind of this genocidal mentality that Netanyahu so openly embraces as well through all of his rhetoric when it comes to Palestinians. But just to give you a sense of like, what is the opposition in Israel? Like, even though there's a couple token seats in the Knesset for Arabs, um, that is, that's, you know, it, it, it doesn't really, they don't really have power in terms of like the Arab population there. You have Arab Israeli citizens who are also oppressed and treated discriminately. Um, but Benny Gantz was the opposition to Netanyahu in the previous election. And he is also an unabashed like war criminal. He's very proud to uh, do carpet bombing in Gaza. He was running the IDF operations during the 2014 war. And he is equally as notoriously just horrible about the entire situation. So it really is like, a, you know, a Trump and then an even more like a Tom Cotton or something. It's like right, really, right. you know, what is the really solution? Um, there seems to be very little chance that we're cutting aid in a meaningful way. Hmm. You know, the last person to threaten that was George H.W. Bush, by the way. But there doesn't seem to be any chance that that is going to happen. Uh, why do you think that is? Why are we so steadfastly, I understand supporting Israel, but we are steadfastly behind everything that they do. That seems to be troubling. Uh, why is that? Why is that so has become such an indelible part of being a politician in America. Even AOC, you know, when she went to go talk, I think it was like before Jewish group, she's like, she, she was like, I'm a little Jewish. And I know that you knew that I'm a little, and you go, it's like, it's a weird like box. that has to be checked. Why can't, is it the fear of being called an anti-Semite? Is it, well, what is it that makes people just hesitant to go, Hey, we're supporting something here that is number one unsustainable, but number two, uh, it's a brutal occupation that is inhumane. I think there's several layers there. The first layer is the fact that Israel has been able to construct this alternative reality narrative that they are victims in this situation, and then if you question the entity like if you question the construct of what zionism is you want a second holocaust of jews right and so for generations people have been put on the defense to be like no 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 like of course i support israel's right to exist as this settler colonial entity that's ethnically cleansing people but i also like i, I support palestinian rights but i think over the last 20 years israel's continuous going on the offense in terms of invasions in Syria, Lebanon, the continuous bombardment of Gaza, where Gaza has no air, like Palestinians don't have an air force army or Navy, right? They have like rockets that they're reconstructing out of mostly Israeli bombs that are dropped on them, um, as well as other means. They don't have the means to, to retaliate. They don't have a, a method of self-defense. Yet Israel's continuing to just carpet bomb them over and over again. And then, of course, tighten the noose of this medieval siege. Um, that, I think, is given the perception like, oh, wait, maybe they aren't, you know, like, <laughs> maybe this is not right. what I thought it was. So that, that I think, is falling <laughs> apart more and more. But that narrative has been so successful and they've weaponized this notion of anti-Semitism to such an extreme degree that it's really made people terrified of questioning it. There's another level to this, which is the highly successful lobbying campaign, which manipulates people that that basically does smear you as an anti-Semite, makes your life very hard in, in your professional career, right, to go anywhere if you question this. I mean, I remember comparing Israel to Israel's methods to Nazi Germany because they were actually forcing Ethiopian Jews to take birth control, which is like, I mean, that that's a classic... Um, yeah. Classic method that actually, you know, eugenics method. And I was, I mean, you, it's like every, every bio of me ever online is like, and she said this, <laughs> like, right. can you right. believe it? It's like, yeah, that's actually a fact. 
But then then you go down to like, who are you up US politicians? Who are corporate media journalists? You know, what is their intention? They adhere to the orthodoxy of Zionism. They they go into these outlets wanting power and access. You know, I don't think they're right. going into there being like, we we really care about human rights and we're really trying to like hold power to account. No, a lot of these people, I, I was in DC for a long time. I know that it's all about access, right? And it's all about having your career be on the ascent. And so these people go in there playing the game, Tim, like they right. know what they need to say. And even if they disagree, right. Look at what happened to that AP journalist. Like she was fired yeah. before she did anything because she was a member of a Students for Justice in Palestine group in college. Meanwhile, you have the fucking editor of The Atlantic, Jeffrey Goldberg, who was an IDF prison guard. Like that's right. the strange. It does seem that it does seem the balance of power is a bit skewed. Um, <laughs> a little bit skewed. <laughs> a little bit skewed. But like, but like the U.S. You know, U.S. <laughs> politicians. Like we grow up thinking that Israel is an extension of the U.S. and so we have this undying allegiance. It's like. Our whole mentality of this perpetual war on terrorism, we like relate to Israel, like their their experience in a war on terrorism. Like we have this weird sympathy and allegiance with them. And I think they we empathize with them to a certain extent without understanding, even though we externalize all of our violence with our our wars and empire. You just but want a, a lawsuit. You just yeah. want a big lawsuit. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and there you go. This is like, this is the cancel culture. Cancel culture is a serious thing. And you have governments around the country passing laws in 35 states now have laws that restrict your speech, your first amendment and prevent you from talking about Israel, boycotting Israel and, uh, pro-Palestine solidarity issues. This is a huge issue of censorship and it is on the forefront of the free speech movement in the U S and you know, the fact that U.S. politicians feel the need to bend over backwards to cater to Israel and actually subvert the First Amendment and Constitution is quite shocking. And I do think it has to do with resources like they they know that Israel is a successful military garrison and battering ram in the Middle East. And this goes back to the 67 war where Israel was basically able to <clears throat> assert its dominance in the region, crush all of these Arab nationalist movements and the u.s was like hey we can use israel just like we use colombia and latin america and just like we use uganda and africa as these kind of you know lynch pads that we can yeah launch operations from right. you know and basically weaken the surrounding states that we want to inevitably take down yeah i mean i understand that you know Israel was founded. I'm like, I'm like, this is the Mossad. Is, the Mossad has got my throat. Um, I understand that, like, America was founded on on settler colonialism and stuff like that. I, I'm not saying that Israel doesn't have a right to be there because you'd have to look at every country that was founded in a kind of ridiculous way and and say that they don't have a right to exist. But there does seem to be um, a real issue with the territorial expansion. The, the open air prison is insane. You can't keep people like that. It's inhumane. It's, you know, and there does seem to be, and obviously the, the, the American right, except for certain parts of it are, are, are insanely pro, um, Netanyahu pro Israel. Um, and then they always give examples of like, well, do you know how bad it is for gay people in Gaza, which is unlike how it is in Saudi Arabia, which is a party apparently, or, or <laughs> Egypt or any of our other friends. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I also don't think Hamas is like a high school theater group. I'm sure that they have, there's problems there as well. Now I read in an article, you're in Hamas. No, I'm kidding. But do you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's, that's what I mean. A real, but in, in order to be a real journalist, you kind of do have to be in Hamas. How, what is your life like? Do, Cause people go at Whitney Webb, who we've had on the show, they call her anti-Semitic. Do you have problems at airports? Do you have problems like because you they know of you and yeah. yeah, so how how much has that impacted your daily life and what you're able to do? Well, I'm banned for life from getting into Gaza and I'm probably banned from getting into 48 so Israel. Uh, but I haven't right. tried to fly into Tel Aviv. I feel like I you know, I feel like I know what the outcome of that's going to be, but I was called an Iranian agent by Israel. When I tried to apply to get into Gaza, they said, you know, I, I'm a propagandist, not a journalist, but I'm also an Iranian spy. 
And I, I was pretty alarmed by that. I'm used to being called a Russian agent or a Venezuelan agent. And I was like, that that's scary, you know, when right. you're called that. Because we know the we know what they do to journalists that don't tow their line. And I'll just give you a quick anecdote. Back in 2012, when I was covering war crimes on a daily basis that Israel was committing on breaking the set, my old show, they shelled a journalist tower that they then leveled just a couple of weeks ago, the Al Sharuk journalist tower. And an RT cameraman's leg was blown off. And my boss wrote them a letter and he was like, why did you shell this journalist tower knowing that there were journalists there? And they were like, A, everyone is a Hamas target because there were satellites on the roof and whatever, whatever. And they're like, B, your network has taken a side in the coverage. So explicit admission of war crimes as well as basically a threat, like an ominous threat to RT and my show, I, I presume, by being right. like, you're covering war crimes. And so we can blow you up if we want to. So yes, I know I'm on the radar. I, we know how crazy, you know, the law, I don't know if anyone's seen the lobby or, or if you've checked that out by Al Jazeera, like they go to great lengths to spy on just peaceful Palestinian solidarity activists to subvert and ruin their lives. Um, and it's, it's an extreme, extreme uh, operation. So, you know, you got to watch out because, uh, what, what role know do you think like, people like a Jeffrey mm -hmm. Epstein or someone who's, uh, you know, I don't know who he's working for. No idea. Uh, could have been France, maybe Zimbabwe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, what do I know? Right. And yet <laughs> some would suggest he was uh, engaging in like a blackmail operation for the Mossad with very high level people in the government. Do, do, do you give any credence to notions like that, 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 uh, you know, this is something that many intelligence agencies do. And, I guess the CIA and the Mossad are just very good at it. And I like, is that potentially why you see people that don't really look at this with a critical lens? Oh my God. I mean, look at what we know the Mossad just did. They took out actual just civilian like scientists in Iran. I mean, this just happened a couple months ago. Actually just did a, like a breaking bad style machine gun operation of like automatic machine guns that just took out this guy and it's just like this is the kind of shit that they're doing all the time absolutely i think that uh you know the cia and Mossad are working very closely together doing all of these covert operations the only reason we even know about that is i think because they were very brazen and actually wanted us to know right responsible this is part of the kind of psyop um but yeah i think that when it comes to things like epstein there's a lot more that we don't know and it, it what really annoys me is people have accepted this weird alternate reality where they're like, oh, the CIA just doesn't do this stuff anymore. Oh yeah, they used to do the, you know, the dirty <laughs> wars and funding death squads and assassinations. Right. It's like, why? Don't you think that they would have just gotten better? Like right. we're in a uh, surveillance capitalism where they actually like can, it's like pre-programming. They know what we're about to do. Like they, they have been able to sophisticate their operations quite a bit. Like, why would you just assume that they're not doing horrific things on a daily basis like that? Where does this lead? If you if you could, uh, you know, step back and look at where Israel and Palestine are right now, does this ever come to a resolution? Do you think that this, does, is the pressure starting to grow and mount for Israel to take a different course? Is the leader after Netanyahu more moderate or reasonable? Or does this ratchet up just constantly? It ratchets up constantly. And Netanyahu, I think, is emblematic of where Israeli society is at. Um, because when he got into power, people were able to kind of take the masks off and say, this is what we feel. You know, we they embrace Netanyahu. And in fact, whenever he does things like just happen in the Gaza Strip, his poll numbers shoot through the roof. You can see this reflected in polling throughout the country. Ninety five percent of Israeli Jewish citizens uh, supported the Gaza war. 80 to 85 percent support the shoot to kill policy at the border. I mean, that would be similar to like 85 percent of Americans supporting just executing migrants like wandering around yeah. by the border like that. I mean, it's a really fascist society. And I, yes, of course, there's opposition. And of course, and I believe in our defense, we only have 75 percent of Americans uh, supporting <laughs> executing migrants. So I think that's right, it's, it's a country I can live in. It's right? Not I can a work huge, with that. It's not a huge problem. <laughs> What does a two-state solution look like? You'd have to normalize trade with Palestine, right? You'd have to there'd have to be an, an an agreement where Palestine could trade with other countries. I mean, they would have to have the rights. They'd have to have right to go places. And 
I mean, is, 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 that was the hope when I was growing up in the 90s. That's all I heard was two-state solution, two-state solution. Absolutely. And, and it, that was the yeah. Oslo Accords. And that was Arafat. You know, that was basically Arafat and uh, the PLO and all of these, like, secular nationalist Palestinian movements that were supposed to be a counterweight to the Islamist rise of Hamas right. that actually Israel helped create and fund and wanted to win the election so then they can just blanket Gaza as this, you know, hostile entity and justify everything that they do by, you know, Hamas being the government. But they helped make that happen. They helped create the situation today so then they can just perpetually use Hamas as an excuse. Now, what does the two state versus one state? I think Palestinians have shown that they are willing to negotiate what that is. But going back to the Oslo Accords, that was supposed to be the future Palestinian state, was what the West Bank is. And that has been atomized and taken over by settlements completely. So for me, it's hard to imagine what the state would look like when it there is no state to be had. I mean, it's you have to go from one settlement to the next. You have to cross military checkpoints. Only 17 percent of the West Bank is actually Palestinian territory without Israeli soldiers present. The rest is is horrifically under occupation. You would have to dissolve those settlements and retreat the settlement boundaries back to the 1967 borders, which is a formula of national consensus. Palestinians have have talked about that they would accept that. But again, like Israeli government officials have have declared that that is not on the table. Even Hamas has been willing to negotiate those lines. So people have said, well, what's the other solution? A one state solution, which means, you know, stopping the occupation, lifting the siege and giving the five million Palestinians who have no human rights or equality, basic democratic rights and having one person, one vote. But that would kind of fly in the face of, of what Israel is. I mean, it's an artificial. Israel is how many people live in Israel? Uh, oh man, I want to say like Seven million? I might be way off. Um, fuck. I, I oh, my producer's, that. Um, look, yeah, my I mean, producer's looking the, it the up. The thing yeah. is, like, for example, it's in, in East Jerusalem, there's a 70% demographic law that you have to have 70% Israeli Jewish citizens there versus 30% Arabs, which means— Nine, nine million. You were close. Oh, great. Yeah. It's an artificial majority, which necessitates, like, ongoing expulsion— of people who live there. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, like I think that we have this abstract notion like, yeah, the native genocide was really bad. Slavery was really bad. That should happen hundreds of years ago, but we still feel the remnants of racism in a sure, lot of institutions sure. here. Imagine that happening like now, right? Like, that's happening every day. It seems like a two state day. solution is the best course. If Israel's willing to give back some of that land and you know, they can figure it out, but it seems unlikely. It seems unlikely without massive. It seems like it's going to be tough to do a one state at this point with all of them. That's going to be hard. And that's all. That's all predicated on the the false premise that you don't want Israel to exist as a Jewish state, and that you know that's where everything falls apart. And I will say, you know, back to this anti BDS legislation that they're passing. Right. This is super surreal because. The Israeli lobby and Israeli government officials, as much as we hear this hysteria about Russian interference in our democracy, Israel has been interfering in our democracy for years and years. They are trying to push the boundaries of what we will accept, like legislatively, to actually change the laws here. Like, I think that they know these anti BDS laws are blatantly unconstitutional, but they're just throwing them out there and seeing what sticks. You know, just like they tried to actually sue a Palestinian woman here for defamation, but knew the statute of limitations had run out. So then they could apply Israeli law in the U.S. That was struck down as well. But this shows you like how far they're actually pushing because they know that they can go far here. And they know a lot of people will just blindly pass these laws knowing that they are. I mean, it's just so flagrant and crazy and brazen that yeah. they are trying to undermine free speech well, here by saying you can't talk about this. You and like you can't work in 35 states unless you pledge to never boycott Israel. That's nuts. Right. Well, it doesn't seem like anybody wants free speech in this country. Maybe you do. <laughs> maybe I do. Maybe there's a collection of people. But left to the right, nobody really wants free speech. But they've been very successful. And uh, But congrats to you because you won that lawsuit which I think maybe is a, a turning point there because you can't define what people are allowed to, to uh, boycott or what they're allowed to talk about. It's crazy. You were going to give a speech on a college campus, right? 
Yeah, I was going to, yeah, this is supposed to be the beacon of free speech, you know, across the country. And I was supposed to give a, a keynote speech about media, not even Palestine. And I was given a contract that says you can never boycott the state of Israel if you want to make money in Georgia and make this honorarium. So I refused to sign. I sued. And a year and a half later, on the heels of the vicious onslaught in Gaza, the judge ruled that this was unconstitutional because what it did was basically say, I need to adhere to a certain type of political belief or speech, which is exactly what it was. Um, and, and and just imagine how crazy that would be to replace the word Israel with any other entity, including the U.S. Right. and Georgia. Right. Like you would be, be beyond the realm of comprehension if you were given a contract being like, you can never boycott Russia. And then you had Putin taking to Twitter, which Netanyahu did after the lawsuit was filed, bragging about the fact that they have passed these laws in the U.S., being like, we've worked really hard to pass all these laws and we're going to boycott whoever boycotts us. It's like now you're threatening us. Like, how is this real? Yeah, no, I mean, it's 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 absurd. Really, it's absurd. <laughs> it's absurd. Gaza fights for, for what are you doing on Memorial Day? Are you do you ever have fun? Because everything you do is so serious. Me and Rogan <laughs> were talking about it the other day. We said, Abby, he's like, Abby, Martin knows balls, mom. And, and do, do you ever just relax and have a nice uh, Memorial Day weekend without having to check for all your stuff being bugged? <laughs> I do, man. I, I love nature. I love uh, having fun. I like to laugh. Yeah. Did your and brother I, leave I Twitter? You, we, we, you, gotta, you yeah. know what I mean? You got to you gotta fucking we, chill out. We miss it, your brother really on Twitter. Stuff. I don't know what happened to Robbie on Twitter. We used to call him at 3 a.m. and, and t try to hunt down yeah, people from that. the 9-11 the truth movement. He said that you're, you're all, you're all wired, jazzed up, jacked up and called them talking about 9-11. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, I mean, listen, it, it, that, that's a Tim <laughs> Dillon experience. Two o'clock in the morning, called you about 9-11. Gaza <laughs> fights for freedom. Uh, watch the documentary. I didn't know much about this, but I watched it and I was like, this is fucking wild. Uh, and, and, and we're going to have all your stuff in the description of the YouTube video here, which I'm sure they'll take down. But tell everybody uh, where to find you. Yeah, so Gaza Vice Freedom, really quickly, this, this shows you what happens when Palestinians peacefully resist. This was a mass march, and they were mowed down by snipers, uh, and it was a, a very shocking war crime that has been completely covered up. Find me on Twitter, Abby Martin. Find uh, Empire Files on YouTube, GazaFightsForFreedom.com, while it's still allowed to be up. Tim, thank you so much thank for caring you. about the issue and having me on. I appreciate no, it. No, we appreciate it. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm learning more and more about it, but that documentary is, is, is harrowing. So uh, everybody go check that out and, and uh, go read what Abby writes. Even if you don't agree with her, she's doing, she's there. You're not there. I'm not there. You're, <laughs> she's talking to people. I tried to join Hamas. They said no. So <laughs> Abby Martin, they, you can yeah. join the IDF, man. You can go join the IDF. They don't want me either. They won't say yes to me. <laughs> I've had Whitney Webb on too many times. All right. Uh, yeah. The Weinsteins will stop that. Anyway, <laughs> Abby Martin, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Happy Memorial Day. Yeah. Peace out.